Again, competition. Now, this competition is open to all high school students, including those from Hammersholt. Uh, and what it is, is it's a business plan competition where your business plan is evaluated by five or more business professionals, successful business professionals here in the community. They give you feedback on your business plan, and then the top five business plans get to compete uh, right here in this competition, this finals. Top three are awarded cash prizes, and all five of them get uh, first-hand experience presenting their business uh, plans to people like you and also to our judges. Right now, I'm going to call up Johnny DeBaker, who is a uh, valedictorian, former valedictorian of Hammersfield High School, and, uh, and chair of the Education Committee and board member at Thunder Bay Ventures. Thank you, Paul. It's, uh, it's nice to know that my greatest accomplishment in life is still being valedictorian at this high school almost 15 years ago. Um, but it is a pleasure to be back, and it's nice to see so many familiar faces, old teachers and that kind of thing. It's, uh, it's my honor to be here on behalf of the board for Thunder Bay Ventures and thanking you all for being here and supporting this wonderful event. Um, Enter the Den is something that's incredibly important to Thunder Bay Ventures uh, as it promotes entrepreneurship and young people in our community. Um, we, we were talking as a board, we're trying to figure out a way to how to engage young people in business and that kind of thing. And, this is what we came up with and, and what we're really trying to tell all you guys today is that you don't need to go out after high school and get a job. You don't need to make your resume and go door to door dropping off resumes. I mean it's a great way of getting a summer job and it is you know a way for a lot of people to get employment but what we're doing here today is we're trying to show you that you can create yourself a job and you can create employment for yourself and you can make money for yourself in the future and you don't have to be uh, working under anyone. You can be your own boss and you can have people working for you and that's what this is really all about. So thanks so much for having me, and I appreciate you guys being here. Thank you. While Thunder Bay Ventures is the one who spearheads this project, we do rely on the support from many sponsors, and um, at this time I'd like to just draw your attention to the... Uh, um, the display board right in the center stage and also to the banners around the room. For those of you, uh, as you're listening to the presentations, if you want to just uh, take note of the sponsors and the other organizations who help make this uh, particular event possible, I'd appreciate that. Um, over the next little while, we're going to, like I said, hearing, be hearing from two speakers. Right now, we're going to be hearing from uh, Scotia Evans from Westgate High School, and she's going to be coming up to uh, present her business plan, Treatwise. Now, it may be actually, I'm not sure if she's 100% ready, so do you know if she's back there? Okay, good, just wanted to make sure. So Scotia Evans is going to come up, and she's going to present for 20 minutes or less, and then we have 10 minutes of questions from our judges uh, at the most. And then we're going to bring up our next speaker um, for a 20-minute presentation, 10 minutes uh, of questions from our judges. Have one final presentation while the judges deliberate, and hopefully we'll have uh, all of it wrapped up before too, before too terribly long. So... Uh, Scotia, if you want to come on up, Are you? Come on up. Uh, and Scotia Evans with um, Treatwise. Okay, so this is my business plan, Treatwise. So today I'll be going over the background, um, my plan, my duties at, at Treatwise, um, my operation, who I'm targeting. Um, how, I'm how, how I'm going to target them, a sales plan, and a break-even analysis. So how many people here own a dog? Okay, now how many have, have a dog with food sensitivities who require a special diet? Okay, so I'm sure it's difficult to find custom-made treats for them, let alone locally-made treats from caref carefully selected ingredients. About half of the population of dogs have an allergy and about 10% are food allergies. My business is special because Treatwise is the only business in Thunder Bay that aims to dogs with food sensitivities. So I'll be making treats for, for dogs with allergies to certain ingredients found in commercial dog foods. I've come up with alternative ingredients that still give the dogs nutrition he or she needs and would get from the commercial dog food. So say if they were a vegetarian, brown rice or peanut butter gives the dogs protein it would get from meat. Buckwheat, oatmeal, and rice, brown rice offer carbohydrates that are found in wheat and gluten, but these ingredients are gluten-free. 
Dairy products give dogs calcium, but alternative ingredients would be popcorn or pineapple, which also gives dogs calcium. Omega-3 fatty acids are found in fish. Flax seeds also have these fatty acids. I've researched these ingredients and they're all safe for dogs to eat. So for the time being, I'm the owner and only worker at TreatWise. My responsibilities and duties are baking the treats, which will be done from my house and responding to order forms. Promoting my product is also very important because I'm going to rely a lot on good word of mouth. I plan to go to dog shows and dog parks to tell dog owners about my, about my business. In the future, as my business grows and becomes busier, I'm going to have to hire personnel, such as bakers and people dealing with order forms. I will continue to promote my treats and gain customer trust. So I have everything I need to start my business at home, so that's where I will make my products. I can buy the ingredients I need for my treats at any grocery store for a small price. I still need to buy equipment so, such as bowls and mixers for making the treats. An estimated cost for these is $300 to $350. I believe that the most important aspect of my business is having a good relationship with my clients because I'm feeding their pets with food that will ensure them a longer, healthier life. In the future, I plan to invest money into starting a bakery and sell and bake my treats from. Also, I would like to start making specialty dog food using the same alternative ingredients I would use in my treats. So I will be targeting dogs with food sensitivities and their owners. This audience will be willing to pay my price because my treats are special, homemade, local, high quality treats. As shown in the chart, uh, my target audience is quite small. Only 4.8% of dogs in Thunder Bay have a food sensitivity. Even though 4.8 is a small percentage, that works out to roughly 1,000 dogs. And I will show you in my sales plan that there is profit to be made. So getting the word out involves me going to dog shows and dog parks and vet clinics and telling people about my product. From that, customers will be able to tell other dog owners, then they will also want to buy into my product. And when, once I get a study full of cash, ads on Facebook or in the classifieds is another way of promoting my business. So I'm planning on selling my treats for $20 a piece because my treats are made local and there is a high demand for them. Also, there's not a lot of competition in Thunder Bay. As you can see, my packaging, um, it's uh, $20 for a half a pound bag and where there's a blank spot on the business card, that's where the list of ingredients will be. Um, but since each dog has a different allergy, the uh, ingredients will be varied between the dogs. So in the chart, is. Assuming I sell to one-eighth of my target audience, I'll be making over $10,000 in the first year. In the next three years, assuming every year another 12.5% start buying into my product, at the end of that three years, I'll make over $40,000. Uh, so the, the graph shows that I'll make, be making a profit in no time. Just after selling six units, I'll break even, because I'll be making about $12 in profit every time I sell one unit. So that concludes my presentation. Is there any questions? Is it on? Okay. Hi, Scotia. Great presentation. Um, I like the idea. I have dogs myself. Do they like the treats? Um, I haven't tested them yet, but I'm sure they will. Because <laughs> <laughs> my dog, I got one dog that doesn't eat anything, oh. even the, the little treats. So you, have, so you have to really test it and maybe put something in it that they're going to really enjoy. Okay. Hi, Scotia. Um, I really like your marketing strategy. I think that uh, it's, it's really bang on in terms of how to get this product in front of your potential customers. So um, I, I think that's a really great part of your plan. I have a question for you related to your target audience. Where did you get your data from? Uh, how did you find out how many dogs in Thunder Bay have uh, an allergy? Uh, well, about 35% um, of uh, households have a dog, so from that, 10% um, have food allergies, so that's, um, I did the math and it came up to 4.8%. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, 
why not sell the pet shops? Why sell, go directly to the, um, to the owner? Um, well, I kind of just want to keep it um, just me doing the thing, uh, doing my business. And so, and I think just opening up a bakery, just selling my product will be the best idea. And how did you come up with the $20 uh, per bag price point? Um, well, I charged higher because it, um, it's, I'll be using, I'll, my uh, treats are designed for the uh, owners, so um, I, it's just special in that way. Okay. Can you give us a, uh, a bit of a, uh, a breakdown, Scotia, of how you go through the process of making the product itself? Like how, how work intensive is it? Um, to, to prepare a bag or a batch? Um, well, it's just like baking any cookies. You just have to mix the stuff and uh, bake it. So it doesn't take very long. It's not very labor intensive. Okay, and you mentioned that um, the, the back of the card is blank so that you can include the ingredients because they're specific to, to, to the pet itself. Um, how do you plan on going through that process? Do you have a, uh, a questionnaire done up right now that you're going to meet with each owner and, and go through what the, the needs are for each individual pet, or are you going to kind of create a batch for different types of allergies? Um, well, I have the uh, order forms on the back, so when people, so I'll have a basic recipe, and then I can replace the, al using the alternative ingredients, and from that, I'll just be able to make the treats. Perfect, thank you. I've got another one too. Uh, how do you plan on handling the distribution? Uh, are you doing delivery or do people pick it up or? Um, probably just picking up, um, they could come to, I also plan to um, maybe open a booth at the Thunder Bay Country Market, so okay. they could pick, just buy from there or, yeah. I have a comment uh, regarding your order form too. Um, when you launch a business, your, your visual identity is so important in your, your branding strategy so that people remember you and when they see you and your, your product that they instantly know uh, it's Treatwise. So before you launch, it would be really great to see a logo for your, for your business and to make sure that your order form has all of your contact information on it so that people know how to find you. Um, you'd be surprised how many businesses that are established in, in town forget to do their, uh, put their phone number on their advertising. So um, it, it's an important thing to remember. Okay. Hi, Scotia. Um, I see some developmental things here that might work for you. Um, you talked about getting to the point you might have a little bakery or something. Often in business you can do what they call clusters, so you could even go to a human bakery and just have uh, often one corner, an aspect of that. Uh, just a thought. Um, I agree with the others, a survey and feedback process just to launch it would be really good. And um, you know, questionnaires about how the dogs respond and you might find one type of illness in a dog results in a poor result, but all the other ones are fine. Um, I also see potential here for a social purpose enterprise, so um, you have to develop processes that are consistent and can be replicated and then you can, once the process is really nice and tight, you can uh, bring in other people to replicate that and grow it. Um, and that might even be something for other younger people or other people in the community who need employment and uh, I imagine be fairly easy to train. Thanks, Scotia. Our final business plan presentation today is uh, Benedict Langille from Westgate with his business, Imp Gaming Community. So we're going to invite Benedict up. All right, um, let's jump right into this. Um, How do I use this? 
got the right dimension. Was it that one? Okay [laughs] Okay, so um, I wanna start off by saying um, this business idea, uh, it started out as an idea, um, but it became true very fast. And it was because it cost very little to run. And I love playing games, so what I wanna end up doing is, I wanna bring a very enjoyable gaming experience to users, youth and adult, who live in Canada and United States region. Our servers will provide users with smooth gameplay and options they would like to see on servers. As of right now, we have one server, it's a twenty four slot server, for the game Team Fortress two. In the future, we wanna allow, um, we plan on having more servers for different games and this will allow our community to play different games and stay within the same community. So, what exactly do I do? And basically, we rent out servers, and we put files on the servers that will allow users to download the files. Once the users have downloaded the file, they'll be able to connect to our server that can, they can play the games on, that we are currently hosting for. And as of right now, we are currently hosting for game Team Fortress two. It's a 24 player slot server. Um, Team Fortress two is a free to play game, meaning that there are many users because it's free to play, there is no fees. Um, and this is excellent because many users will have it. And the way free to play games make money is off of in game microtransactions. And in game microtransactions are, say you want an item in a game and you can't, like you don't wanna wait to get the item, so you skip ahead and you buy the item. That would be considered a in game microtransaction. So, once we have players playing on the server, most definitely they're gonna keep coming back and this will end up creating a gaming, gaming community. The server will most likely be filled up on a daily basis <clears throat> and this is good for us because users will stay and when you have more uh, players on a server, more are bound to join because no one likes playing alone online. So, if the user enjoys the server, he or she most likely will donate because if a user spends more than 20 to 30 hours on our server or has a high stat rank in our um, ranking stats, users will most definitely donate just because it'd be a shame to see our server shut down because we didn't receive a $10 fee donation. So I'm gonna go into some trends here. Um, PC gaming is becoming more and more popular every year. Um, and with Steam being the most <clears throat> popular method for buying online games and playing games, they have over 50 million users and two to three million online each day. So here's some facts about PC gaming. It's um, more users spend more time on PCs than consoles and I believe this is because uh, PCs are multimedia. You know, you can watch videos, you can stay in touch with your friends. Um, not only that, games are cheaper and this is because you're purchasing a downloadable copy. You're not going to the store and picking up a hard copy of the game. 72% of United States <coughs> people play PC games, and um, another thing is the PC is upgradable. Unlike most, con well, unlike all consoles, um, they can't be upgraded, which means over, over, I don't know, a year, it becomes very outdated. So this is the rise of PC gaming, and this is their revenue going up and console gaming going down in the millions, and as you can see, in the year 2009, it was eight million, and then in 2012, it's around 12 million, and console gaming is going down. So what does our community do? Um, as of right now, the community does many things, and this is ranging from giveaways to events, and the reason why we do host um, events This was a way for users to interact with other community members in a fun way. So the community will most definitely play different games. They most likely won't just stick to one game because it gets boring after a while. And if community members do so, respect the server, um, they can add the imp tag in their name. And this is great because it's a way of advertising as well. 
because if you go into a different game or into a different server and you see a bunch of players with imp in their name, you're bound to ask, well, what is imp? And they can redirect you to our Steam group. So the community will also be able to use the website to stay up to date with our changes we make to the server. Uh, they can also use the website to meet and compare stats with other users. And we also want them to suggest ideas. We really encourage this uh, because we want to be molded by them. So our website. Currently, right now, uh, the domain name is imp-server.com. Um, the homepage, it's quick and easy access to everything our website offers. It leads to the forum. submit a staff application in order to get admin or moderator rank in the server. So the Steam group, um, that's another way of staying in touch with us. If the user feels they don't want to give away their email address, um, they can join the Steam group and they can um, stay in touch with us by just using their Steam name. So our server runs a plugin called GameME uh, server stats and it records so donations if the user wishes to donate there are two ways of him or her doing so um, the first way is obviously through PayPal. And um, it's quite easy. You navigate to the home page and you click on donate and you'll be prompted with this page. Five dollars, you'll receive the uh, the donator tag in game, which is a um, basically saying you donated five dollars. You'll have your name put on the Hall of Fame, um, which is all the users who have donated so far. They'll be put into a pitcher, and you'll <coughs> be put into donator only draws. The next rank is um, when you donate ten dollars, ten USD. You'll receive the extreme donator tag. Um, in game and you also received one reserve slot for a month and the way that works is if a user say the server is full it's 24 out of 24 players the extreme donator can join the server and it'll automatically kick someone who is either not doing too well so is way at the bottom or is afk first so advertising um one way of advertising that we are currently looking at is youtube and we were doing, we were thinking about doing a video ad campaign, and it would target players who, or target users on YouTube who type in such things as Call of Duty commentary. It wouldn't be targeting other users such as, I don't know, how to cook. They wouldn't, it wouldn't, the ad wouldn't play there because it wouldn't make too much sense. <coughs> uh, right now I have a YouTube account that currently links them to my website, to the server group, and to um, the Steam group. Uh, also, another way of advertising is if the player does choose to put imp in their tag name or in their name. Because as I said, they'll go into other servers and most definitely other players will ask what is imp. So this is my break even um, analysis chart. Um, this is the course over one year. Um, it's around $207 and we need around <coughs> 20 donators to break even if each donor were to uh, donate $10. So in about two years, we, um, we hopefully, we 
plan on seeing ourselves hosting games for, hosting different servers for four different games. And those games consist of Gary's Mod, Counter-Strike Source, Counter-Strike Global Offense, and Left 4 Dead 2. Um, this is roughly gonna cost around 600 USD. And this is including the website and slat, uh, stats. We plan on having even a bigger community than we already have because more users play different games. This also means we'll receive more donations because different users play different games and more users will join the community. And this concludes my presentation. Is there any questions? Great job on the presentation, and I checked out your website yesterday and uh, thought it was pretty cool. I've got a couple questions for you. How many users do you have on now? It really depends. Um, what do you mean by like online right now at this like how moment? Many, how many accounts have you set, ha, are, are set up on your server? On the website, there's currently 49 to 39, I believe. I don't know the exact number, uh, but on the stat tracker, it's set around 400 to 500, last time I checked. but. The stat tracker has been frozen because my PayPal account was frozen because I did an online thing and <clears throat> I asked for a refund and he didn't refund me and claimed a dispute. So my PayPal account was locked and I couldn't pay off this month's server stats for the website. Ah, uh, that PayPal. <laughs> uh, another question, um, the donations thing, that, um, seems like a, to me like a little bit of a risk because you don't know how much revenue is going to come in. So have you um, looked at any other ways? I was thinking maybe YouTube product reviews relating to products in the game or anything like that. Have you looked into any other sorts of revenue? Yes. Um, one, rev one way of revenue is, as I said, T Fortress 2 has items that are worth USD value. Mm -hmm. um, now, when people want to quit TF2, they usually sell their backpack, and their backpack can range from $100 to around 1000 to even more. Now, what me and CJ do is we buy the backpack at a lower value of around, say, it's valued at $100. We'll go for it around 70 And um, you have to find the right people, but they will sell it. And then you can convert those items into keys and then sell the keys for $1.80 USD online. And you make more profit than the backpack actually was. Okay, so kind of like stock trading yep. in-game. Okay. Uh, and how about uh, doing product reviews? Like, uh, are there any like Logitech keyboards or anything like that that you could review on your YouTube channel? And also... How is your YouTube channel and what kind of things do you do on it? Well, right now, um, I've posted, I believe it was three videos, and they consist of, one was gameplay, um, the other two were reviews of a modification for another game. Um, that's about it for the YouTube. So do you think there's a way that you could perhaps make money by doing reviews on YouTube uh, using the, um, like the, the server channel as kind of to, to build up your network? Most definitely, yes. We've also looked into using Google Ads. Uh, I can't say it. It's uh, Google Ads for the website. In terms of the, uh, the website itself, it looks uh, quite extensive. Um, between your, you know, yourself and anybody else involved right now, how much time does it take for, for you to manage that website on a, on a weekly basis? Um, very little. I'd say around an hour. Okay. So, so the, the infrastructure that you have in place right now in terms of the gaming and, and all of the, uh, the transactions, those microtransactions that you're referring to, mm -hmm. uh, that all is done already and it's already sort of self-managed by the system itself? Yeah. Okay. Um, another quick question. You had mentioned, you know, with respect to levels of donation and how mm -hmm. you handle those levels of donations and, and what happens when, you know, the, the service full and all of that. Yeah. Um, Right now, are you operating on a regular basis where you're close to having that server fairly full on a regular basis? Well, with the Steam group, we actually have the, um, we have the ability to invite everyone in the Steam group. And I know that I believe the Steam group consists of around 200 users now. Okay. And you can automatically invite everyone. And if they feel to join out of 200 people, we'll have a full server. OK, so the server is full on, on a regular basis. So that kind of leads into my next question. When you're looking at. Um, customer satisfaction um, in terms of somebody donating a bit more than somebody else. Are, are there concerns about upsetting potential 
donors that are going to get kicked out of the server, or do you think that that's going to um, entice them to, to well, want to donate? Like I said before, um, lower ranker donators, they um, they won't be, I didn't include that, they most likely, they well, they won't be kicked, because if they donated, they'll be, they'll probably know how to play the game, and they won't be sitting AFK in our server, mm -hmm. taking up the slot. But what I'm what I'm thinking more along the lines of is if you've got somebody that hasn't quite donated yet that's starting to think about it, and mm -hmm. all of a sudden they get booted out on a regular basis, do you think that's going to affect the perception of the of the system? Maybe um, we we have looked into actually increasing our player slots to 32 player slot, okay. and then having it so it maxes out at 24, and the rest of the slots are reserved for donators. Okay. I think it'd be the opposite. I'd want to donate so I didn't get kicked out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, to your point with the um, with the website, uh, there's a lot of people out there that want to be moderators and stuff on a site because it's kind of you know a, the cool thing to do, and you get a special tag part and everything. So it's pretty much free labor to make the website and make posts, and you get tracked on every post that you do. So there's a lot of people that are really trying, and it just helps out your business for free. Okay. I have a question for you. Um, what's the average age of uh, person using your games or gaming mm, I don't I don't usually don't talk in game but um, I would say um, nine because you need a laptop um, most people have them and the game's free to play so it really costs no money so nine to 20 okay so in terms of taking a donation um, you you need a credit card correct yes like I said though if if the user can't use PayPal because of that, they can donate in-game with uh, the Steam trading. Okay, so I, that was uh, answering my next question. And so my last question is, um, have you used Facebook at all to, to promote uh, the game and uh, to reach out to youth audiences that you think might, might enjoy this game? No, I've never thought of that. Okay. Hi, Benedict. Um, how did you get into all this? Um, like I said, I was playing. I was playing the game one night, and I ran into CJ, um, and you know we formed a clan, and then we started talking about well, what if we had a server for the clans to play, like for our clan to play on, and he's like, well, I'll take a look into it, and we found someone who was willing to host a server for pretty cheap, and next thing you know, the next day we had the server up and running. Mm -hmm. And from my perspective, I, I don't do gaming or very limited experience, so I had difficulty with your written plan because I didn't understand what the terminology meant. Mm -hmm. So I find you having you present is much more helpful because you come across very knowledgeably. Okay. Um, if there was a way to somehow convey your personal knowledge and passion into your marketing materials a bit more, I'm not absolutely sure how you do that. Um, but um, it might even be more on the YouTube line or the Facebook line, but uh, just so if you're going for funding, it doesn't matter so much if you're a player, but if you're trying to appeal to the establishment, you know, funders and that type of thing, we don't all understand this world. Hi, Benedict. Good job. Thanks. I'm totally lost. I was hoping that I could see the game. That's one of the things because I'm trying to visualize and I think I'm too old for that. Um, one thing that I'm not used to hearing is donations. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, donations to me is for a nonprofit organization but you want to make a, a profit. Is there something that you can do to boost up your re revenue, like getting them into the game, getting them addicted in the game, and then to get up a level, you have to charge a certain fee? No, if the user feels they want to donate, they, that's, it's not, we don't, we're not forcing them to donate. Okay. It's, it's the culture, the one that I'm not aware of. <laughs> I'm too old, sorry. <laughs> but you did an awesome job. Thank you. Sound like big tobacco. <laughs> <laughs> Benedict, I actually have a question that kind of just piggybacks on Barb's question there is, do you have examples of really successful businesses who have used this business model uh, and, and gotten thousands of dollars in donations and are running very successful uh, businesses 
uh, using this, this same model. Yes, um, <clears throat> they go by the name of the UA clan, I, I believe. You'd have to Google it and it'd be the very first thing. It's like UA assault clan. Um, they're making profit off of this. Um, I have went to their donation page and they have a donation marker and then it records everyone who donates automatically and it's way above and beyond the green. They, they were asking for 200 this month, they made 435. In terms of your business, um, what would make you more unique than somebody else attempting to do the same thing? Being molded by the community. Uh, because bigger communities, they usually, they won't take everyone's input as serious as we would like. Um, we would take everyone's um, suggestions into consideration and we have community polls posted on the website for it. Because a lot of communities that are way bigger, they don't have time to look down on the people who don't really affect their server. Well, our audience has joined us halfway through this, and so I want to give you a brief recap of what we've heard so far today. Uh, the very first three presenters uh, were Gregory Sanders, and Gregory Sanders was from St. Patrick's High School, and his business was, was, is called What's Your Beef, which is a beef jerky business based out of Atacocan, Ontario. Um, after Gregory, we heard from Mac Lockyer, and Mac's uh, from Churchill High School. His business is called Rink in a Blink, where he sets up maintains and uh, operates uh, household rinks for, uh, for hockey in the winter. Um, he also stores the, uh, the equipment uh, during the off season. After Mac, we heard from Lexi Engberg uh, from Superior High School, and she, her business is called Lazy Camper Grill, and that's a business that's uh, planning on doing food service in the Pass Lake area, uh, particularly burgers and ice cream. And then we heard, uh, this is where you folks came in, you heard from Scotia Evans, uh, Treatwise, uh, with her uh, pet bakery, and then uh, from Benedict Langeal from Westgate High School uh, of Imp Gaming Community. So we've had a wide variety of businesses. Right now, what we're going to do is we're going to ask our judges uh, to go and deliberate. So we're going to excuse our judges uh, from the room as they go off and deliberate to try to come up with a winner. And as the judges are doing that, we're going to call... Phil Bistrikin. Now, Phil Bistrikin was last year's winner of the Enter the Den contest. And Bistrikin Apps is a programming company that creates apps for the web. And Phil's going to come up and talk to us about his business uh, while the judges deliberate. And uh, so if you could give Phil your attention, I'd appreciate it. You can tell, um, and he'll tell you what's happened in the last year uh, during uh, the time from the last Enter the Den. Okay, my name is Phil Bisterkin. I'm last year's Enter the Den winner. And my business is called Phil Bisterkin Apps. And I'm just going to go over a little bit about what I do, the app store, and uh, what's happened after Enter the Den. So if we start off with my business, it was founded in August 2010, and that's when I was in grade 9. There, I have nine apps right now on the app store. And I've been doing this for about three years. And I've gained a lot of experience over that time. And that's basically what helped me to win Enter the Den last year. I also have three years working with servers and the web aspect of apps. So basically, from the name, you can probably figure out that we program and develop iOS apps. These apps are then sold through the App Store, and sometimes i also done freelance work, once for a bank out of Texas and currently for a couple local companies. Right now in the App Store, there's over 700,000 apps, so it's a huge market that I'm in with just my nine. But I'm, I'm doing pretty well in there, and it's working out. There's 177,000 other iOS developers like me, so there really is a whole lot of competition over 400 million devices, so there's a large market as well. Everything about the App Store is just gigantic. There's also, there's been over 50 billion downloads, 
and about 150,000 to 200,000 of those are actually of my apps. So the first app I'm going to talk about is the very first app I started with. It's called Pitch Counter Lite. It's a really simple idea. It gets over 1,000 downloads a week. I'll show you what it looks like in just a second. It was number one in the sports what's hot in the Canadian App Store, which actually really surprised me when I saw that. And it's had over 100,000 downloads. Oh, that number's wrong, but it, that's a, that should be 100,000, not a million. So this is what it looks like. It's really simple, and that's basically the key to a lot of my apps is to keep it simple. Coaches in Little League and in uh, up to, well, basically up to professional have to keep track of pitch count because there are specific rules that say how many pitches you can have in a game. So this app allows them to do that, and it also allows them to keep balls and strikes, which is really handy as a coach when they're trying to see how their team's doing. Here's a uh, screenshot of the App Store. As you can see, it's in the top corner, number one in the What's Hot section. And uh, here's another view of it, and that's what it would have looked like if you opened the sports app, the sports section of the App Store last year. It was, I was actually very surprised when I opened it one day and saw my app right there, right in the number one position. The next app I'm going to talk about is basically the second thing I moved into. A lot of my apps are based on sports, and this one's called Pitch Speed. It's one of the most popular paid apps I have. There's also a free version, and it gets over tw it's had over 20,000 downloads in the last six months. With no advertising, I think I'm doing pretty good. So you may be wondering what it does. Basically, it calculates the speed of a pitch by using the distance the pitcher is from the uh, plate, because that's a set distance, and then the time it takes for the ball to travel from the pitcher's hand to the catcher's mitt. And here's what it looks like. It's, again, a really simple design, very easy to use. You press the button when the pitch is thrown, and it starts a timer, and then you press it again when it's stopped. The timer stops, and it calculates the speed by using the time and the distance. And then it saves your pitches for later so you can compare and see how, basically, how fast your pitcher's been throwing and if it's consistent. Here's what it looks like on iPad. It's basically the same thing. And the uh, speed section is, or the uh, previous pitch section is just hidden. The third and final app I'm going to talk about is Hockey Shot Counter. And what this lets coaches do is to keep track of their, sta their goalie stats. And I was really surprised to find out the first year when I released it, I was on a, uh, a midget A hockey team, and I saw my coach using an app, and I actually figured out it was mine, and he didn't know it was mine. <laughs> and so when I told him, he, he was uh, really surprised, and he gave me a few suggestions on how to improve it. And I know of another coach, too, that also uses it, and I think my coach might have actually referred that other coach to my app. So they are getting around even in the local community. It was the 31st most popular app in the sports app store last year during the winter. Here's what it looks like. So it basically lets you keep goals, saves, and it gives you a save percentage for your goalie and then I, for the other team's goalie, or if you want to use it for... Well, yeah, uh, my coach actually used it. He used one goalie for our team's first goalie and the other for the second. And then it saves the stats, so you can save for a, various, a large number of games, and then it allows you to graph them. And there it was, 31st in the Sports App Store last year. A freelance work. Before Enter the Den, I did a little bit of freelance work on this app. This was for a, uh, I did a little bit of work on this app for a bank in Texas. They needed a few changes made. Then after Enter the Den, the word got around that I started to make, that I could make apps. And I got a couple people asking me, like the Lakehead School Board, they talked to me about doing an app. And same with the drivingschool.ca, they talked to me about doing an app for them. And so I've gotten a lot of exposure after Enter the Den, and because of Enter the Den, it's helped me grow my business. So if you'd like, you can follow me on Facebook and, uh, and Twitter.
my Twitter handle and Facebook's right there. And that basically concludes my presentation. So I'm going to uh, just ask Phil a few questions. Uh, for those of you here at Hammerschild, actually this year, um, you can pass this along to your business teachers. Uh, we actually had no entries from Hammerschild this year. So next year we'll get some Hammerschild entries in. Uh, so Phil, with Enter to the Den, tell me basically how this competition helped you with your business in the, in, over the last year. So as I said before, it helped me get a lot of exposure to people who didn't know I made apps. And it also helped me improve my business uh, from some of the tips that the judges gave me last year on how to market for free and things like that. So what were some of the advice that uh, you got from the judges? Uh, give us a couple pieces of advice that you were able to act on. So the very first thing I did, uh, they told me to use Facebook and to, get it, and to use Twitter. And right after that, uh, a lot of the judges, or a couple of the judges followed me on Twitter and liked my page on Facebook. And then it sort of got the, uh, the word out about the pages in Thunder Bay and the like, I started getting more followers and more likes on Facebook, which meant more exposure for my apps and more free advertising. So one of the things that uh, Johnny talked about when he uh, was up here was the fact that you don't need to actually just go out into the workforce after high school and put out resumes and get a job. You can actually build your own job and actually jobs for other people. Um, as you go forward, how do you see your career path changing based on you know, this, your experience with entrepreneurship? Well, right now, now after, especially after running the business for a few years, I know it's a viable option to actually have after university or after college to, to be an entrepreneur. You don't have to go out into the workplace and find a job like everybody else. You can do your own thing. You can run your own business, be your own boss, set your hours and make however make an unlimited amount of money basically you're not limited to a salary so what are some of the steps you're going to need to take between now and that unlimited salary <laughs> <laughs> well the main thing really with apps is exposure and word of mouth uh, if people don't know about it they're not going to be able to find it and at, yeah and if they can't find it you're not going to get downloads and you're not going to make that unlimited amount of money the same thing with freelance work. If people don't know you make apps, then they're not going to come to you and ask. After people learned, I started getting a lot of people coming to me and asking me, oh, can you make an app for this? There's even a joke uh, around school that's like, Phil made an app for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Phil. I appreciate your time. <laughs> thanks, Phil. For those of you, again, uh, as an audience, you came in halfway through. Uh, this event is supported and run by Thunder Bay Ventures, which is a community futures development corporation. And what that simply means is uh, the federal government puts money into making sure that entrepreneurship, small business, and, uh, and new business ideas are expanded within a community. And the one, one of the ways that they do that is by funding community futures uh, development corporations like Thunder Bay Ventures. And Thunder Bay Ventures is an organization that's able to loan money uh, and often sometimes actually give small uh, grants to businesses that are just beginning or uh, businesses that are up and running and want to expand. So uh, for those of you, actually this is just a quick uh, raise your hand kind of poll. How many of you uh, have ever thought about actually working for yourself or running your own business? See, and, and it's actually interesting because you see it's usually about 20% of the, the audience. It's usually about 20% of the people out there that are willing to do that. How many of you come from small business families? Okay, so there's a few of you that actually come from small business families. And, um, and what we know is that, uh, what we notice is that uh, entrepreneurship, for the most part, is not something that's, that's common and runs throughout all of society. But it's something that can be nurtured and it's something that can be uh, fostered and grown. And so for those of you who are interested in entrepreneurship, I would encourage you to enter the Enter the Den contest, enter, enter the den, and, uh, and, get, and participate in this. I would also encourage you to take your business classes at high school. So. Uh, the judges need a couple more minutes, okay. so we're gonna take a break. 
Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take about five minute break. For those of you, uh, you can talk amongst yourselves and then we'll come back for the judges' final results.